careful how much you take. There might not be enough for everyone. Who did not hear the sentence when growing up? Engraving scarcity in our brains is such an essential part of our upbringings. And as many people, I experienced this narrative of scarcity in my childhood. And now, when I look around, it still is very present in our lives. In fact, our political and our economic systems are built upon it. And a lot of sustainability debates circle around it. We have to produce less. We have to consume less so that things will work out. But actually, I find this is quite a harmful view towards life. So I had to make a decision because I knew I was getting quite depressed by this. And I was thinking, in which future do I want to live? Do I want to live in a future of scarcity that is ruled by privilege? And I knew the future I want to live in is a future of abundance. And then when I contemplated about that, I realized the future I want to live in, it is already here. We have enough. We, in fact, have more than what we need. It is not a question of scarcity. It is a question of distribution. For example, something very fundamental, food. Globally, we produce 30% more food of what we would need to feed the planet. And still, people are starving. And this is not because there is too little food. It is because the food is miserably distributed. So it is a question of distribution, not a question of scarcity. And now, when we zoom out and look at everything that we consume, that we want, that we need, and when we look at how it's produced, it can be broken down to three fundamental forces. Labor, raw materials, and energy. And they're interconnected. So labor is all the work that you and I, that we all put into our jobs day by day. And to work, we need raw materials and energy. And raw materials, like sourcing them, refining them, and all these things. To do this, we need labor and energy. And energy, for example, electricity, to produce it and to transport it, we need labor and raw materials. And the interesting thing with this is, when we continue to automate things and with AI and robotics, we will need less and less labor. And when we continue to close material loops to a more and more circular system, we will need less and less new raw materials as an input. But the energy demand will raise. So this is why energy is such a fundamental resource to us as humanity. So we want and we need a lot of energy. And energy is not only electricity to like power a light bulb or to charge your phone, but energy also comes in the form of fuels, for transport, for example, or to heat things up. And not only to heat houses, but also to fuel countless industrial processes that require process heat. In fact, we need 85 exajoule of process heat every year. That is 85 billion billion joule. That accounts for 20% of the global energy use. Remember this number for later, it's important. So the question is, how do we get to abundance in energy? And here we have it again. It is not a question of scarcity. It is a question of distribution. In fact, every day, there's thousand times more energy arriving from the sun at the Earth than what we need as humanity, including fossil fuels and everything. And even if we strip this number down with all reasonable constraints that there are, we have 20 times the energy available from wind and solar alone than what we would need. In fact, we already have negative prices on electricity regularly because there is abundant electricity in the grid. So how do we make this abundance accessible? If we think about the supply chain of energy, it is three steps. The first step is how do we harness it? The second step is how do we transport it? And the third step is how do we store it in the meantime when we don't need it? And frankly, we're quite good in harnessing and transporting it already. So let's talk about energy storage. 
When we think about energy storage, the first thing that comes to mind is a battery, like a chemical battery, a lithium-ion battery. And they are great, but they're quite expensive. They often consist of scarce materials. They often have some supply chain issues, and they're toxic at end of life. So don't get me wrong, they're great for certain use cases, but there's a simpler, cleaner, and cheaper solution to store energy, which is dirt. So you wonder, what would you do with dirt? So we built heat batteries out of dirt. But what to do with stored heat? Remember, 20% of the global energy use is for industrial heat. And this is right now all produced through burning fossil fuels. If we find a new way of generating and storing industrial heat, we will have profound effects on us as humanity. So how does it work? Dirt, in the form of fire bricks, of bricks, has an excellent heat storage capacity. So we take these bricks, and then we put them into an insulated box. And then, when there's abundant electricity in the grid from solar or wind, we use this electricity to heat up the bricks to 1,000 degrees, so they're glowing hot at that moment. But what's next? What do we do with the hot bricks in a box? So we use them to fuel industrial processes. And industrial processes sound a lot like steel and cement, like heavy industries. But they're much more than that. They're also a lot about our daily treats. For example, cookies. I love cookies, so let's go and visit a cookie factory. They're baking cookies all day, all night, and they use process heat for that. And right now, they burn gas to create this heat, to bring the ovens to operating temperature. And gas is a fossil fuel, it is quite volatile in price, and I don't even want to go into how bad gas exploitation is for the planet, so back to the cookie factory. Instead of burning gas, they can just take our heat battery, plug it to their heating system, and bring the ovens to operating temperature with that. And the best thing is, while the battery is up and running, it can recharge itself when there's abundant electricity in the grid. Companies will love that they can just decouple their operations from the volatile energy prices. And it comes with plenty of benefits beyond that. The battery lasts very long, like 30 years with almost no degradation. And at end of life, it can be disassembled and reused elsewhere in a different form. There's nothing toxic in there, nothing that can explode, I mean, it's dirt. And all the materials that we used are long-term tested in industrial settings elsewhere, so they are scalable and safe. And this is great news not only for my fellow cookie lovers, but for our entire manufacturing system, because this technology can fuel most of the processes that require process heat. And this is how we can shift from scarcity to abundance within our energy system, and that will change our entire society because it will change all the ways in how we produce the things that we consume, that we want, and that we need. Because the future of abundance does not have to be a distant dream, it is here and now. Thank you.